You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. If you're a true disciple, not only are you following me, but you're also following the instructions. I've gave you an instruction manual, and it's love letters. It's just love letters to you. God says, I love you so much, don't do this. That's what a parent does. Isn't that what we do to our kids? Uh, don't play with fire. Why? Uh, you get burned. Don't play out in the street. You get run over by a car. And God, he just gives us guidelines. And if you stay within the guidelines, blessing. But I want to grow. I want to learn more about my Savior, my God. And so he's given us a manual. And if I'm continuing with him, I love him, I'm going to continue in his word. The Bible is simply just an instruction manual full of love letters. How cool is that? We have the living and breathing Word of God, and it's filled with guidelines and letters specifically for us. The God of the universe gifted us with His Word, and it's incredible. In today's message, Pastor Ron will remind you of how amazing that gift really is and how you should take advantage of that gift. A true disciple of Jesus, someone who truly loves Jesus, will follow His instructions to the best of their ability. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 8 as he continues his message, The Test of True Discipleship. It tells us that the rocks were split in two. It tells us that the graves were opened. And it also tells us that the veil that was in the temple, and by the way, the veil that was in this temple was 18 inches thick. And it was torn from top to bottom down the center. In other words, symbolizing from God to man. Now God says, I want everybody to come because of the sacrifice of my son. But there were supernatural events that took place that no one could deny. And some recognized that. When he was lifted up, some recognized that's that's the son of God, that's him. For example, in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 54, we read about the centurion. The centurion was the one in charge of the soldiers there. These are the guys that drove the nails into Jesus' hands and feet. These are the guys that he said, hey, stick a spear in his side, make sure he's dead. That's the guy. This is the guy in in charge of all of that, an evil dude. And yet, as he saw this take place, it says, as he was watching Jesus and the earthquake and those things were done, he feared greatly and said, truly, this is the son of God. Here was a man who who saw what was taking place as Jesus was lifting up. That's the son of God. And then we read in Luke's account, chapter 23 and verse 48, that another crowd of people gathered together, seeing what had been done, beat their chests. What have we done? So God was breaking hearts right there and people recognizing this was the Messiah as he was lifted up. But let me also add that that many commentators would agree that the lifting up not only refers to the crucifixion, but also his subsequent ascension as he was lifted up into heaven that he was lifted up. So he was lifted up in the cross, but also glorified and lifted up into heaven. So let's finish out the story. What happens as Jesus is lifted up? He's lifted up on the cross. People come to him. He's ascended into heaven. And right after his ascension, we know that the early church is meeting in an upper room. The Holy Spirit comes upon him, and everybody's gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. Jerusalem is swelling with people. Large crowds from all over speaking different languages. And Peter comes out, and he begins to preach the gospel. And you know what he says? You guys know Jesus of Nazareth because you crucified him on a cross. You lifted him up on a cross. But God has now lifted him up. He's now at the right hand of the Father. And it tells us they were convicted. And it says 3,000 souls were saved and added to the church. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, then you will know that I am he. And many did. And so these guys said, who are you? Jesus says, when you lift me up, you'll see. Many will recognize And then he adds in verse 28 that I do nothing of myself. My whole journey is the journey in line with the Father, to go to the cross, to die for men, for the sins of the world. I do nothing of myself. Man, that's a pretty radical statement. I thought about that. That's a great personal devotional. As I just contemplate, I do nothing of myself. I ask myself, could that be me? I do nothing of myself? Uh, That's not true. I find that I do a lot for myself, right? A lot. Think about, think, if you just think about how much of your time is spent on yourself from the moment you get up, you know, you brush your teeth, you comb your hair, or, well, some of us don't have to do that. <laughs> you dress yourself. Oh, what clothes do I want to you know, I take, I want to feed myself. What do I feel like eating, you know? And it's, it's all about creature comforts and what we want. And yes, there are sacrifices for others. If you're married, you have kids and so forth. But so much of our life is about us. 
And yet everything about the life of Jesus were for others. I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. Everything that communicated out of the mouth of Jesus, even those words that were hard to these religious leaders came from the Father. And he who sent me is with me, verse 29. The Father was always with the Son and the Son with the Father. Now, the great thing is, what is true there is now true of every believer. Isn't that awesome? Jesus said, I won't leave you comfortless. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. He'll be with you and in you. And then we're told in the scriptures, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the Father's presence is with me. I have the presence of the triune God with me all the time as a believer. Oh, I love that. How encouraging that is when I'm facing battles, when I'm facing difficult, I'm like, Lord, you're right here. You're right here. You've got a plan. You've got a purpose. You're working, and I just want to be in alignment with heaven. Oh, how comforting that is. And so he says, the Father hasn't left me alone. They were in constant union. In fact, in John 10, 30, it says, Jesus says, I and the Father were one, for I always do those things that please him. Now listen, if I'm walking in union with the Father, I'm gonna do that, right? How, how I need to do those things that please him. You know how much of the stuff that we do that is wrong in our life would be eliminated or the gray areas would be eliminated if we just said, does that please the Father? Jesus said, I always do those things that please him. Do I? He said, well, I could do this and still, you know, but does that please the Father? I mean, that's between you and your conscience alone because not everybody's there to see. But if I was to ask myself all the time, would that please the Father? God, are you glorified in this? I think a lot of things that we kind of, you know, we put on the fringe would be eliminated. It becomes pretty clear. And Jesus, of course, is our example, always pleasing the Father. Well, here again, Jesus indicts these men for their refusal to accept him as Messiah, and he condemns them because of their unbelief, which is so sad. But in doing so, he also defines for us in this interaction the confirmation of a true disciple as the conversation continues. Now, we find this in the second half in verses 30 to 36, because notice how he begins, and this is pretty astounding when you think about it. All this radical interaction, it says, and when he spoke these words, many believed in him. And you go, what? What? How did, some believed in him? That seems kind of crazy, but that's awesome. Well, if that's all we had in the text, we'd say it is awesome. But as we read out the rest of these verses and the rest of the chapter, we see that they were not saved. We're gonna see these guys say, oh, we believe. They must have said something like, oh, we believe. But their belief was a shallow belief. In fact, did you know that there is a belief that doesn't save? Well, you say, I know that, Pastor, like Hindus and Muslims. No, no, no. There are people that would actually express a faith in Jesus Christ, but it doesn't say. You say, well, where do you get that from? James 2, 19. It tells us this, the demons believe and tremble. There's a fear amongst them, a fear, uh, an honoring, a hollowness towards God, yet they don't believe. Demons believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is God Almighty. They're not saved, right? So saving faith, we need to understand, has to go beyond an intellectual understanding of facts of who Jesus is, to absolute trust and obedience to follow him. And so here we have some people that had a belief, but as we look at the rest of the chapters, we're gonna see they become furious with Jesus only to prove they were not true disciples, not true disciples. Again, Jesus said we need to make disciples of Jesus. And so we gain some greater understanding as we move through these verses, I pray. See, one of the most common questions asked, I mean, it's asked me, I don't know how many times a year, and and we even talk amongst it amongst ourselves. How do you know if that person's really born again, right? How do you know? How do we know if that person's really a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus gives us some things that we could actually hold on to as we look at this passage. It begins in verse 31. Jesus then said to those people who said they believe, oh, you believe, really? Okay, "If, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. So that, that's very important. If you abide, now that word means to remain, to stay, to continue. What constitutes a true disciple? Well, of course, it would begin by faith in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is God. He died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the dead. He is Lord, yes. You could believe those facts, but it's more than that. It's actually trusting your life to him and following him, or as Jesus said, abiding with him. The word abiding here is memete, It means to remain, to dwell, to abide, or to continue. That's really the best translation. Old King James has it right. If you continue in my word, you're my disciples. 
It is so translated in 2 Timothy 3, 14. You must continue in the things which you have learned. Hebrews 13, 1, let brotherly love continue. And Jesus is saying, if you continue, you are my disciples. True discipleship is marked by faithful, loyal continuance. That's essential. Jesus has taught this many times. Again, I'll come back to the parable of the sower. Remember, the sower goes out to throw seed. It falls on four different soils of ground. The first is on a hard path, hard ground. The seed goes there. It can't penetrate. Birds come and take it. The other one falls amongst the, you know, the weeds, right, the cares of this world. And it grows up for a while, but, and it might even seem, oh, look, there's fruit. Yeah, but the cares of the world choke it out. But then there's a third one. Now, of course, we know the fourth one is it bears fruit. It's fruitful. You see fruit in its life. But the third one is found in Luke 8, 13. It says, the one that falls amongst the rocky soil. Now, rocky soil is very common over Israel. There's rocks everywhere. And there's limestone everywhere. And there are many places where the ground is shallow. Only a few inches deep. And beyond that is limestone. So you plant a seed. It goes down. But because it can't get its roots down, it'll grow up for a while. But it withers. So Jesus says, these that fall amongst the rocky soil, they hear the word of God with joy. Oh, that sounds great. I like that. I like that Jesus stuff. But they have no root who believe, here it is, for a while. And in time of temptation, they fall away. They're not true believers. So there are those who have a belief, but it's a shallow belief. After a time, they, they move away. They prove that it was not genuine because they do not continue. Genuine faith continues to walk with Jesus. You could say that genuine faith works, right? It's, it's, it's active. James put it this way, James 2, 17. You're familiar with it, right? Faith by itself, if it does not have works, if it does not have fruit, it is what? It's dead. <laughs> it's just dead. It's just words, and so our pattern of living must manifest genuine faith, and genuine faith continues. We have so many examples of this, but the classic one is we just saw it not too long ago in John chapter 6. You remember Jesus had fed the 5,000. And actually, in Matthew's account, says 5,000 men, not including women and children. So there might have been upwards to 20,000 people. We don't know. But it's a massive crowd. And they've seen Jesus do healing, and now Jesus is feeding them food. I mean, it's like a walking buffet. This is awesome. JC for president, right? And they're following him. And in John 6 and verse 14, they actually say this. This is truly the prophet, capital P, who's come to the world. That's a declaration of what God said to Moses. Moses, I'm going to raise up in the future a prophet like unto yourself, capital P, the Messiah. He's going to come. And they're actually saying there, this is the Messiah. He, he's arrived. They believe that. So Jesus knows, though, their shallow faith. He begins to express to them the cost of true discipleship. Understand, Jesus wasn't interested in getting a massive group of converts. Awesome. They believe that's all I want to hear. They just believe, and that's it. We're filling them up, man. No, he was concerned about getting a small group of sold-out disciples because these people are going to turn the world upside down, right? And so Jesus begins to share with them the cost of true discipleship and what happens. If you look at John 6 and verse 66, because it's very important, we noted it when we were there, from that time many of his disciples, these actually people called themselves disciples, went back, walked with him no more. Not genuine disciples. They were fair weather disciples, right? So it's important that we always share the cost of true discipleship. We don't be hasty in making converts. Now listen, uh, we give an opportunity to accept Christ every single Sunday in this church. I'll be expressing that opportunity for you today. But you know, there are times, I have to be honest, the, 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 the offer goes out, but if we wanna know, is someone genuinely born again? Well, we're gonna look at the fruit of their life as time goes on. That's how we're gonna know. Because if you genuinely say, Jesus, I'm all in, then you're all in. If you're saying, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life, that, you know what that means? It means Lord's here, I'm down here. He's not just Savior. He's not just Savior. He's Lord. And when he's Lord, that means everything lines up under his life. What do you want me to do, Lord? How do you want me to live, Lord? Oh, I have to stop doing that? I'll stop doing that. That's good because I want you to be Lord. I need to start doing that? I'll start doing that because I want blessing. And you begin to experience the blessing, but it's, it's following and continuing and growing in Jesus. That's the true disciple. But that doesn't always happen, right? It's sad. 
We have another example. I'll give you one more verse. It's found in 1 John 2.19. In context, speaking about the same thing, talking about those who are part of the church and then they leave. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have, here it is, continued with us. But they went out that it might be manifest that none of them were of us. So it's not enough to just say, well, I believe. It's evidenced by abiding or continuance, okay? That's so important. Now, notice he says here, let's move a little bit further. Let's add to that. He says, now, if you continue in my word, then you're mighty to say, you're continuing my word. In other words, if you're a true disciple, not only are you following me, but you're also following the instructions. I've gave you an instruction manual, and it's love letters. It's just love letters to you. God says, I love you so much. Don't do this. That's what a parent does. Isn't that what we do to our kids? Uh, don't play with fire. Why? Uh, you get burned. Don't play out in the street. You get run over by a car. And God, he just gives us guidelines. And if you stay within the guidelines, blessing. But I want to grow. I want to learn more about my Savior, my God. And so he's given us a manual. And if I'm continuing with him, I love him, I'm going to continue in his word. Thomas Brooke, that great Puritan of old, said this, no man obeys God fully who does not endeavor to obey God fully. Again, no man obeys God truly unless he endeavors to obey God fully. So in other words, if I really mean it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to abide in Christ, and I'm going to abide in his word. But then there's something else. One other thing I want you to see in verse 32. He says, and you shall know the truth. I just want to stop there. No. That word know is a very important word. No, the word is gnosko in the original language, and it means to know by experience. I mean intimate experience. How intimate? Well, in Matthew 1 and verse 25, speaking of Joseph and Mary, it says, Joseph did not know, gnosko, her, Mary, till she brought forth her firstborn son. The word gnosko is such an intimate word that the Bible itself uses it in conjunction with marital intimacy. And the point is this, a true disciple of Jesus Christ knows Jesus intimately, intimately. In other words, I just don't know about Jesus. No, I know him. I have a, I have a personal relationship with him. So if I meet someone and says, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they, they, don't, they don't seem to continue. I never see him at church. Or what church do you go to? Uh, what's the name of that church we go to? You don't even know the name of the church, right? That's, that's amazing. Or sometimes they remember the church. That church oh, and they, oh, well, who's the pastor there? Ah, oh, what's that guy's name? Then you don't go very much. I mean, I've heard that many times. It's, it's, I love that little test. So if you come here, at least remember the name and the pastor. It's just, no. You know, the, but it's just, it's ideas. This gives you an idea. They, they're, they're a church, and do they abide in God's word? Not really. And, and do they talk about Jesus? They don't have nothing even to talk about Jesus. You can see there's nothing spiritual there. That's not true. If you're truly a Christian, you know what? You have a sense of an intimate relationship. It just kind of leaks out in your conversation, right? Just like it does if you're married. You know, if you're married, I, I, I hope you love your spouse. This is an awkward silence right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right? You love your spouse. So you love your spouse. Your spouse loves you. And because of that, you're talking about them. Oh, yeah, my wife and I went there the other day. Yeah, I went to this restaurant. It was really good. there. Or my husband and I went over there. And we, and we talk about one another because we're friends. We love one another. We're intimate. And we, it just comes out in your life. And the same is true if you have a relationship with Jesus. It comes in our life. Yeah, I was at church the other day. It was great. Oh, I was in the Word. Oh, I was reading the Word the other day. Oh, I was heard a praise song. I mean, you're just talking about Jesus. It leaks out in your life because you know him. You know him. That's important. So Jesus has kind of given us some tests here just as he's interacting with these guys, right? Now, he says, you shall know the truth, and that truth will set you free. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about the truth of himself. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and life, man, you have new life. You get set free. You say set free from what? Set free from sin. Set free from darkness. Set free from yourself. So Jesus says, you have freedom. Now, in response to these words that Jesus said, I want you to see their response. It's kind of ridiculous. Then the answer said, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we'll be made free? So let's pick up on the last statement. Forget about the other stuff of abiding in the word. and I don't want to do any of that kind of stuff or have an intimate relationship. But forget about that. But talk about bondage. They picked up on that and said, what are you talking about, Jesus? We've never been in bondage. Man, these guys are short-sighted dudes. 
How about 430 years in bondage to Egypt? You forget that one? Oh, yeah, yeah. How about being taken captive, 10 tribes, to Assyria and assimilated, taken into bondage? Oh, yeah, yeah. And how about Babylon coming down to Judah and putting you into captivity for 70 years? Oh, yeah. And how about your current bondage to Rome? Oh, yeah. Well, you've never been in bondage to anybody. Well, Jesus, of course, was speaking to them spiritually. And so he answers, says, so most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits a sin... Remember, he said, you guys are in sin. You commit a sin. You're a slave of sin. Guys, you're in bondage to sin. We're told in Romans 6, 16, that slave, uh, sin enslaves us. And here's the thing. You say that you're gonna go to heaven and I'm going down beneath, but let me tell you something, verse 35. A slave does not abide in a house forever, but a son abides forever. And what is he talking about? Well, of course, in the Roman Empire, you have six million plus slaves, Everybody knows about slavery. It was everywhere. And here's the thing. A slave had no rights, no status, no say at all in their fate. They could be sold or taken away to another person. They had no security of residency. But not true of a son. A son who is born to a family of a Roman has all the freedom of being the son of the father in his future estate. Jesus says, you think you're going to heaven? You're gonna abide there? No, I tell you, you have no security of that at all. The only one that has the security is a son, a child of the father. You say, how does that happen? It happens, it tells us in John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God, children of God, to those who believe on his name, to those who believe. The only way, you think you're, you think you're not in bondage, you're in bondage. The only way you're gonna have security of heaven is by giving your life to me is what he's saying. Therefore, he says, and he puts it clear, if the son makes you free, that's himself, the Messiah, then you're free indeed. And so Jesus, he reaches out to him one last time. Now, we're gonna stop here. We're gonna pick up next week where we live off here in this interesting interaction afterwards. But here we also see a test of true discipleship, right, as we look at this interaction. What is a true disciple? Well, a true disciple is one who believes in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? That's the start. That's a start. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But let me ask you this. Do you abide with him? Do you continue with him? Do you have that track record to say, yes, I'm continuing with Jesus. There's fruit in my life. Awesome. And then beyond that, do you have an intimate relationship with him? Do you know him? And does he know you? You know, it's possible that maybe it's been superficial. Maybe, you know, it's possible. I, the way it was for me for many years, I went to... Christian school and church all the time, but for me, it was just an intellectual understanding. I never truly surrendered my heart to Jesus Christ. That could be the case maybe for you today, I don't know. What I know is that you need to be certain, that's for sure. I love what uh, Scott Camp said. He said, well, if you even say, well, I think I'm 99% sure, he said, then you're 100% lost. That's <laughs> true, because you want it, you, you know. When you're saved, when you know you have a relationship with Jesus, you're right. man, you know it. And if you don't know that, you wanna be certain today, you can. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I wanna give you that opportunity or an opportunity to come back to Jesus if you've been far from him. So will you bow your heads with me? Lord, we just thank you again for this uh, passage that's so clear and forthright as you interacted with the religious leaders. Lord, you did so because you were concerned for them and concerned for their deceptive ways that they could even deceive people into thinking the same way they did that you just gotta be a good person or just believe some facts or whatever it is and you're shooing for heaven, but Lord, you made it clear, no, it's by only accepting you as the son of God. And so Lord, we, we don't wanna just accept facts, we wanna move into a relationship with you. We're so thankful, Lord, that Christianity is not a religion because you're not into religion and neither are we. You're into a relationship. You wanna know us and us be known by you. And Lord, we want to truly know you and abide with you and experience the freedom of the forgiveness of sin. As you said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint, who is making his way through the Gospel of John. In this Gospel, Jesus makes several divine claims about himself. For example, in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Jesus is claiming that he is the only way to God. There is no other way or person who can get you into heaven. This goes against our culture today, which believes that there are many ways to go to heaven or that all good people go to heaven, no matter who or what they believe. What do you believe? If you have any questions or want to talk about anything you heard today, we'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us at 281-648-5800. Again, that number is 281-648-5800. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. If you're in the Friendswood area, why don't you join us in person? You can find our location and service times at ltlradio.org. If you can't make it in person, we highly recommend downloading our mobile app as well. The Larger Than Life podcast is available to stream from the podcast link, or you can subscribe from your favorite app so you never miss an episode. We hope you'll join us next time for another message from Larger Than Life.